Hi, my name is David Ducar. Welcome to Seething Airfield, where today I'm going to bring you one of the most incredible stories from the Second World War. Um, it's a story about humanity. It's a story that shows that there can be good on both sides of a bad situation. Um, and it's one that we're really passionate about. And incredibly, Seething Airfield, where you stand now, plays a huge part in it. So the story I'm going to bring you today is, in about, is about a, an American bomber called Ye Old Pub, a B-17. And the two main characters of the story are Charlie Brown, who was an American pilot, and Fran Stiegler, who was a pilot of the Luftwaffe. So Charlie Brown was a young man, he was just 20 years old, although he actually lied to his crew, told them he was 24, just to gain their confidence. Um, he had joined the American Air Force, and he was waiting nervously for his first mission. So the mission we're gonna tell you about today is Charlie Brown and the crew of Ye Old Pub's first ever mission, okay? Um, so we have Charlie Brown on the one hand and then Fran Stiegler on the other. Fran Stiegler is a really incredibly experienced German fighter pilot. He had flown with JG-27 uh, during the North African campaign, was a top pilot. He had had 27 aerial victories to his name which meant the way the Germans set up the, the system and the structure for claiming victories, that he was just one American bomber kill away from earning the Knight's Cross. This much heralded, much desired um, award uh, in, to the German forces, um, which really all the pilots were after. It was a, a case of uh, getting the sort of recognition for what they'd been doing, getting some personal recognition, um, and it was really, really the, the award that everyone wanted. Franz Stiegler was just one German bomber victory away from that. To give you some background of the aircraft that Charlie was flying, you have the B-17 Flying Fortress, which really the clue is in the title. This thing was an incredible machine. It had a crew of 10, it had uh, 11 machine gun um, placements on it. Um, it was an incredibly well defended aircraft, um, but it had to be because of the American tactic of flying and bombing during the day, um, these were extremely, extremely vulnerable. So really the strength for the B-17 was solidarity in numbers. They used to box these aircraft, uh, aircraft up in incredibly tight boxes. And if you can imagine the crossfire from all these aircraft, that is how they managed to try and defend themselves, obviously with ideally some fighter support as well. So with the B-17s, it was all about strengthening numbers. Um, that was the name of the game. What you didn't want to be, you didn't want to be left behind, you didn't want to be a straggler. So stick in formation, stay tight together, and that was really where the B-17 came into its own. Now the story I'm going to tell you about today, which like I said, uh, is one of the most incredible stories of the war, um, took place in 1943. So just to give you a real brief background, at this stage in the war, Europe was um, was still a fortress. Okay. Um, Hitler and the German army were still very much in control of mainland Europe and the only way that the Allied forces could really take the fight to Germany at this point in time was to mount these huge scale bombing raids. So the Americans were bombing by day and the RAF, the British, were bombing by night. And that is the sort of um, the time that we find ourselves in, in during this story. This was really, at this moment in time, um, one of the main ways that we could take the fight to the heart of Germany, that we could disrupt their war effort, disrupt their industry. Um, so what these guys were doing was really incredibly important. So we take you to the 20th of December, 1943, just before Christmas, the crew of Ye Old Pub were getting ready for the Christmas dance, um, and they were all very much looking forward to it. They just needed to get this raid out of the way with their first raid, um, flying with the 379th Bomber Group uh, on a raid to Bremen. So the raid was gonna go fly over Bremen, and the idea was to bomb heavily the Fokker Wolf um, aircraft factory where they were producing planes. So that's what these guys were doing. They were flying over Europe, over Germany, and really taking the battle to, to, to the heart of the German war effort. This was their first raid. So you can imagine this collection of young men nervous, uh, nervously getting ready, going through their pre-flight routines, perhaps not trying to show to other crews how nervous they were, but they knew this was a big deal. Um, and I don't think they quite knew what a big day it was going to be. So they formated and they took off and they rose up through a thick, a thick layer of cloud over Kimbolton, which is where they were stationed 
and along with 474, well, they were part of a bombing force of 475 bombers. So this bombing force stretched for 80 miles and it was the honour of the 379th, therefore with Charlie Brown as well, uh, to lead that attack. Charlie Brown was up front, but because he was a newcomer, he was um, placed somewhere in the formation called Purple Heart Corner. So you were awarded the Purple Heart if you were injured in battle. And this place was a place of danger. They, he was very low down in the formation and very um, close to the front. So that's the position they were flying in. These 10 brave, nervous young men doing their duty, flying in this tight formation across the North Sea, uh, and into Germany, heading into Germany. So the first thing they see, they're flying over the North Sea, which is an incredible psychological barrier, uh, barrier in, in itself. And then they sight the German coast ahead of them. Okay, it's like, right, it's down to business. Now, when they had the German coast in sight, things started to go wrong for the old pub. So engine four started running rough. There was no reason for it, it started running rough. So they had to shut it down and, and, and reboot, reboot it. Um, but they just sort of struck a note of uh, a caution in, in, in their mind, but they carried on regardless. So they're plowing into Germany now. They're on one rough engine. Now over the coast of Germany they go, and as they line up for their bombing run over Bremen, uh, the pilots had to essentially lock into position and fly straight and level for around 10 minutes, around 30 miles, so that they could complete as accurate a bombing run as they could. And it was as they all formated and they all got into this um, position that the German flak opened up and the German flak was fearsome. So they had these huge guns on the ground firing as much flak and anti-aircraft fire as they could in the air to disrupt this huge formation. Now you were told about flak that if you see the black burst in the distance, you don't have to worry too much about it. But the moment you see any colour in those flashes, that means they're getting too close for comfort. And as Ye old Pub was on the bombing run, flying straight, flying level, they were holding the front end. So they were hit really badly in the front end. The front end of the B-17 was made out of perspex and that was hit directly. Um, and it sent 200 mile an hour sub-zero winds howling through Ye old Pub. Um, Charlie Brown checked in with the crew, checked in that everything was okay. Um, but what they didn't realise at this moment in time, that because of the sub-zero temperatures, that the majority of the guns on New York Pub had frozen. So now we're going, we're flying over Germany. They have one engine out. They have the front end, which has been holed. Uh, this inexperienced crew are trying to work together, trying to process it, and then poof, they're hit again. Now a shell goes completely through uh, the tip of their right wing miraculously missing uh, the petrol, uh, their petrol tanks. Uh, and really the crew just couldn't believe it. They were like, oh my God, but let's stick to our task. Let's do our duty. And then as they were literally coming up to the factory, they were hit for a third time. And this time they were hit and one of the, another one of their engines was damaged. Okay, it started running incredibly quick and threatened to sort of rattle and shake itself off the wing. So that engine again had to be shut down. So. As they're approaching Bremen, you can imagine how the crew felt and you can imagine the state of this bomber. You're talking about a hole in the, wind, in the wing, a hole in the front end, an engine that's out, an engine that's running rough, um, but yet they carry on. It's pretty, I mean, can you imagine on your first mission, you must be thinking, oh my God, like what have we let ourselves in for? But they do their duty. They carry on over Bremen and they unload their bomb load and the B-17 almost takes a jump for joy. As the weight of the bombs is released, the plane jumps up and they make the slow turn back for Kimbolton. Now, things started to really go wrong um, for, B uh, for the old pub at this stage. So because of the damage that they had uh, sustained during the bombing run, they started lagging behind a little bit. So as the bomber formation turned and head back, Charlie Brown was in a low down position and he was looking up at the other bombers and he knew that the rear gunners who were looking back at them was thinking, oh, man, I really feel for those guys. Because he knew Ye old Pub was falling away from the formation. And like we've already said, strength in numbers. That's where the B-17 needed to be. They needed to absorb the impact of the um, enemy aircraft which were bound to come but each take a little chunk of their impact themselves. That was the name of the game. You didn't want to be a straggler. And Charlie Brown found himself slowly, slowly falling back and losing height. Now, it was at that moment 
when Charlie was really trying to assess what's going on around him, um, they heard Eki, who was the rear gunner, shout, bandits, bandits behind. So Charlie Brown was like, right, okay, this is the situation. And there was a squadron of um, BF 109s behind them. Now, can you, they're over Bremen. They're essentially alone at this point now. And they're badly, badly damaged. And they have this squadron of aircraft behind them waiting to bring them down. Now, Charlie Brown is in his position, really trying to work out what to do, what his next move is, when he looks up and sees a squadron of FW-190s in front of him. So they've got aircraft in front, aircraft behind, he's flying a badly damaged bomber, and he's deep over Germany. Now, at this moment in time, Charlie Brown freezes momentarily, just like, oh my God, what on earth are we gonna do? How do we get out of this? He feels compelled to keep his crew safe. Um, as you would do as the pilot, as the captain. Um, but he's stuck, he's in a bit of an inertia. And then he remembers his boxing days and he switches himself back into his boxing days where he remembers being in a fight in the ring. And he remembers being so startled by the person he was fighting that he didn't respond, he didn't react. And he took an absolute beating just because he didn't react. And he really made a pact with himself from then onwards that every time he got into a fight, he would be proactive. He would react, he would take the fight to his opponent. And that's what he decided to do that day. I mean, really, that sort of incredible sort of outlet through action, I'm not just gonna stay here, let's do something. So as the attacks started bearing down, the uh, uh, Eki, the rear gunner, brought his guns around to bear, tried to open up and realized that they were frozen. And it was at this moment in time they realized how undefended they were. But all they could do, all the, the gunners could do on the old pub was track the German plane as they go past. Because they knew the German pilots would be watching the guns and they're almost trying to bluff them, just to put that doubt in their mind. But really the attacks, the attacks started coming. They started coming from the rear initially um, and then actually the, the damage started to mount up um, and it became a really, really sort of quite um, daunting task they had to do. Now, Charlie's tactic, so every time the German attacks came in, he got the crew to call out on the intercom their position. And if you can imagine the wingspan of a B-17 from above, it's quite big. And imagine it looking at you, it's so much smaller. So that's the wingspan from above, a huge target. And that's the wingspan straight on. It's, it's an, a lot smaller target. So what he started to do was haul this aircraft around the sky as people were calling out where the attacks were coming. He would haul the B-17 to face it, to present a smaller target. And really, this really threw the German pilots. They didn't expect a B-17 to really fight back. And actually, it's a fighter plane tactic, is to face the attack. And that's what Ye old Pub began to do. And Charlie was heaving this aircraft around the sky, heroically trying to keep his um, crew safe. Every one of the crew was calling out where the attacks were coming from. I believe there were two machine guns still working. They were pumping away on, on the 50 cows. They brought one of the German planes down, but the damage started to mount up. It just started to mount up. The attacks were coming front. They were coming from the rear. Eki, the rear gunner, was tragically killed. Russian, the waist gunner, was really incredibly badly wounded um, and he lost the leg below the knee. Um, you can imagine the, the internal conditions of the old pub. There was blood everywhere. And as every attack came in and the, the plane was getting peppered with these um, cannon shells and machine gun bullets, the crew described looking out and it was like a sieve. It was just holes everywhere and daylight beaming in. But still, Charlie's trying to keep the fight up. He's trying to maneuver as best he can and find a course out of Germany. Now, to give you like a damage report at this moment in time, so the rudder of, of B-17 is badly damaged. The, um, the horizontal part to the rear of the aircraft is badly damaged. The rear stabilizer is pretty much gone. So this plane has no right to be, to be flying. At, uh, at this point in time, in terms of power and in terms of engine, they're on one good engine. They're on two engines that are running really rough and one that isn't working at all. The crew are in a really bad condition. They have a hole in the wing. The front end of the B-17 has already been blown up. The whole fuselage is peppered with bullets. Charlie's been hit in the shoulder, um, yet still they carry on. Still they haul the aircraft around. By this point, Charlie's getting angry. He's just trying his hardest. 
and as the damage starts to mount up and build and build and build, he hauls the B-17 round and slowly the B-17 give up, gives up the fight and slowly begins to fall to earth. So they're around 25,000 feet up and they fall to earth. And during the attack, the oxygen, um, the oxygen supply behind Charlie and his co-pilot Pinky's chairs had been damaged and the oxygen flow started, um, started to stop. And as they're falling down, both pilots pass out. And you have this huge, heroic, badly damaged bomber slowly, slowly falling to earth. Now, as they came down low enough to around 15,000 feet, 10,000 feet, naturally the oxygen um, got thicker in the air and Charlie regained consciousness. And literally in front of him, as he's looking, is his whole windscreen is, is filled with the, the sight of German fields. They're, they're careering down. He tries to wake the co-pilot up, but he's still completely passed out. So Charlie begins to pull back for everything he's got. He has his feet on the rudder bar and he's pulling back, trying his hardest to get this B-17 to maintain normal level flight, but it's hurtling towards the ground and it's really, really not looking good. You think of the damage, you think of everything that's going against it now. The German um, planes that have been attacking them are sure that this aircraft is going down and they actually claim it as being shot down. Um, but Charlie Brown hadn't given up the fight yet. So he's heaving and heaving and heaving back as the ground's rushing up to meet him. And he literally pulls back just in time where there were parts of treetops embedded in, in the old pub. And the crew that were coming to, as they were thundering across um, Germany, could see roof tiles shaking on the roofs. That's how low they were. But miraculously, they were still flying. The old pub was still flying deep in Germany, still airborne, just, only just. Now, Charlie gathers his thoughts, tries to get his crew together and says, look, plot me a course out of Germany. Um, so as best they can, you can imagine the carnage that's within this aircraft at the moment in time, but they plot a course out. They try their hardest to uh, avoid the heavy flak emplacements on the coast. But what they don't realise is they're about to fly directly over a German airfield. And on the ground, you have Franz Stiegler, who had been up um, in his 109, in his sort of mindset, heroically defending his homeland. And he'd been up, he'd had these huge, um, huge, amazing, amazing dogfights. And he has to land, he has to land to refuel, he has to la land to rearm. And he actually realises he has a bullet um, embedded in his radiator. Um, so he's on the ground speaking to the ground crew of, of this German airfield. And all of a sudden they hear this low rumbling and they look over across to the trees and the sight of this huge and battered B-17 slowly flying over the airfield um, is one that they, that they just can't believe they're seeing. It's flying so low and so slow that they think it's going to land. So they watch it in awe and then Franz just snaps into action mode. He leaps into his 109. He just says to the ground crew, forget about the bullet in the radio, let's go. And in his mind thinking, he's looking up thinking, that's the aircraft, that's my kill, that's my Knight's Cross. One more aircraft and he earns the Knight's Cross. So the, the Yield pub is actually making slight gain in height at this moment in time. Char, um, Franz Stiegler takes off in his 109 and he looks up towards um, the Yield pub and he starts to make, um, make progress towards it. Now the rear gunner in the B-17 sees him coming up and just thinks, oh my God. Like we can't, they literally cannot take another hit. This plane has no reason, there's no right to be airborne, yet it still is. Um, but the, the belly gunner in the ball turret, his guns are frozen as well, he can't respond, so he tracks Franz. But in Franz's mind, as he gets closer, he thinks, you'd shoot at me if you could, but he realizes that he can't. Now he goes through the same process. Franz Stiegler sits a little bit lower in his chair and he gets himself ready for the battle. So what goes through Franz's mind, as it always does is, May the best man win. He who fires straightest, he who fires first wins. He's been in this duel with rear gunners of B-17s before. And basically he's settling down for that. He's looking up, he's making progress. He's seeing this plane looming larger and larger and he gets ready to take the shot. And he takes aim and he feels the pressure start to build on the trigger and he stops. He stops because something doesn't feel right. And as he approaches the plane, he just starts to see the damage and the scene 
that presented him. And Franz Steger in that moment answers a higher call. He answers a call that sort of transcends this conflict. And it's the call of people. It's the call of humanity. It's the call of one person doing good to another person, of being in tune with other people. And for some reason, he just can't take the shot. And he gets pulled in closer uh, to the rear end of the B-17 and he realises why um, the rear gunner didn't open up. He can see the guns pointing towards the earth and he can see the red, the crimson um, around the cockpit and he can see, see the state of Eki and he just can't believe it. He just can't believe it. So he kicks his rudder out to the side, flies around to the side of the old pub, looks across and he can literally see the crew of the B-17 huddled around um, Russian, trying to keep him alive, giving him the morphine, um, and it's just the state of carnage. Like the, this, pl this plane is peppered with holes. He can't believe it's still flying, and he can't bring himself to shoot it down. It, like I say, it, there's something that triggers within him, something we have, all of us have within us, that sense of duty to do the right thing to another human being. Um, and that higher call really comes to Franz Stiegler in that moment. Now, he's trying to process his thoughts. So he fl flicks the 109 round and four mates on the right wingtip and starts trying to get the attention of the pilot. So Pinky, the co-pilot, and, and Charlie are furiously working away, trying to sort of maintain level um, flight. And they look to the right and they look back. And what Charlie decides is literally the worst nightmare that he can imagine is sitting on the wingtip and Frank Stiegel is looking back and they're presented with the sight of this Messerschmitt 109 full mating next to the B-17, a B-17 that is one hit away and they just think, what on earth is he doing? Is he toying with us? Just take the shot if you're gonna take the shot. Um, and they look across and they see the German pilot gesturing. So he's flicking his wings towards the right as if to say, Sweden. That's what Franz is trying to say, he's trying to say, Sweden, go and land in Sweden. So at this moment in time, Sweden was a neutral co uh, country. So he thought that ye old pub's best chance is either to land in Germany or to go to Sweden. But obviously Charlie had no idea at the time. He was having an incredibly bad, stressful day and he's so focused on getting back to it, um, Britain that he has no idea what he's trying to say. Franz is gesturing him, Sweden, Sweden. Um, and, and Charlie and the crew just can't fathom what's going on. Now, really, Franz at this moment in time has made the decision in his mind that I can't bring this plane down and I'm in it with him. But what he realised um, before the crew of the B-17 did is as the coast of Germany approached, he knew they were flying over an incredibly well defended um, area, a flak area. And if the B-17 flew over the coast, the German gunners were that good, they would bring it down, absolutely no doubt. It was flying relatively low, relatively slow, uh, and it would have made an easy target. And Franz decided in that moment that I can't take the decision to spare this plane, not to shoot this plane down, and then just sit back and watch um, as someone else does. So he's absolutely with it, um, in and with it. Um, sorry, he's absolutely with them. So he formates on the wing, he pulls his aircraft out slightly, and in his mind he's thinking, I know the German gunners are incredible, and they will recognise the silhouette of my of my 109 they will look up and they know it they know them by heart so they will see the b17 but they will also see the 109 and they and he hoped that it would put enough doubt in the crew of the german gunners that they didn't take the shot now the german air force had some captured b17s so he would hope that the german gunners would just kind of assume that is this a, a captured b17 and they're on maneuvers together or is the 109 trying to get it to force land over germany but what Franz wanted to do is create enough doubt in their mind um, so they didn't take the shot. So as this unique formation flew over the German coast, incredibly, not a single shot was fired. So Franz not only saved his aircraft by coming in behind it, but answering the higher call by not pulling the trigger, he then saved it once again, spared it once again by flying with it over the coast um, and saving it from the flak. Incredible, like, I mean, what an incredible thing to do. And if you actually can consider what he's actually doing, he could have been shot for this. So he, it, I mean, you, he was in a war and had he had been recognized, then without doubt he would have faced the firing squad. But there was something in him 
There was a real connection to right and wrong, good and bad, and he had to do the right thing. Now, as the two aircraft flew out across the North Sea, um, he thought, right, I'm gonna go and try and speak to the pilot. So he flew up and over the B-17, and Charlie Brown was aware of the shadow passing over the cockpit, and he landed Charlie's side. And Charlie looked down and just thought, I can't be dealing with this now. Like, what do you want? What are you trying to say? Franz Steger was desperately trying to say, Sweden, Sweden. And Charlie said to one of his crew, look, go up into the top turret, swing it round and point it towards him. And whether it fires or not, let him know how we feel. And Franz really sees all this. He's flying that close that he sees all this happening. He can see a member of the crew in the cockpit. He can see it go into the gun emplacement, into the turret. And he thinks to himself, that what else can I do? What else can I do? And then completely on the spur of the moment without even thinking about it, he looks across to Charlie, he salutes, and he pulls his one and nine away. And he flies off. Just absolutely staggering and incredible. Now, I think the magnitude of it didn't hit the crew of Yale Pub at this moment in time because they had a huge task ahead of them. They had to get across the North Sea and Charlie said to his crew, look, I am, I'm taking the decision. I'm going to gain height and you guys get out now before we get too far. So literally just as they're crossing the, post, the, the coast, get out while you can. And the crew deliberate and the, re the response comes back to Charlie. We're in this together. We're in this together. So they slowly rumble across the North Sea. And it takes some half an hour where at any moment this plane could break up. It has no right to be airborne. And then as they're sort of over halfway, coming up to three quarters of the way across, these two whoosh, whoosh, green flashes fly past the old pub and everyone flinches and Charlie's thinking, is it a German fighter again? Are we under attack again? And miraculously, it's two American Thunderbolts. And this time, it's the Thunderbolts that fall mate, on the wing of the old pub. And Charlie looks across and he sees a smiling American face looking back with his face mask dangling down and his goggles on his head and he sees a big grin on the pilot of the P-47. And oh, Charlie and the crew just can't believe it. You imagine for hours they've been going through this epic ordeal. Um, and they, here they are with um, salvation in sight. They still had a huge battle ahead of them and they were losing height. They were still over the North Sea when Charlie was looking at the um, pilot of the American fighter and he points ahead and Charlie looks up and he could see the English coast. I mean, can you imagine what a sight that would have been? Now, as they fly over the coast, um, by this point, the two aircraft have peeled away and Charlie's looking for somewhere to land and he realizes that actually there's nowhere ideal to land. And then in the distance, he sees the two aircraft circulating um, um, above what he thinks and hopes is a landing spot. And where they're um, circulating is above Seething Airfield. It's above here. So that is the amazing part that Seething Airfield has to play in this story is it was where B-17 was about to make the landing. You know, this was that last place of salvation. Um, and it, it's quite incredible, really. So you old pub tried to lower their un undercarriage realise that uh, the hydraulics have been badly shot away, so they have to crank it down by hand, get the flaps down. Um, but Charlie Brown can see seething, you can see the control tower, and he's coming into land, and incredibly lands his aircraft in one piece after an epic, epic ordeal on their first flight together. And he lands here, he lands at seething. So, incredibly um, poignant and an incredible story uh, from the Second World War of really that core of humanity and absolutely um, phenomenal that Seeding Airfield plays a huge part in it. It is where Ye Old Pub came down. Um, the crew were immediately uh, recommended for medals all round but when the story of Franz Stiegler came out of this crazy German pilot who seemed to spare them did he fly with them he certainly felt like that as soon as that was mentioned by the crew of the b-17 it was hushed up by the authorities they didn't want this information getting out so any offer of medals or bravery for the crew was rescinded and they were told do not mention that flight again and that's how it was left and charlie brown went on to have a successful war career as did franz stiegler but for both pilots the events of that day was so deeply ingrained in their mind. So Charlie 
um, used to have reoccurring dreams and nightmares that of his B17 going down in flames with with a um, Measure Smith 109 on his wing. Uh, the moments of that day, he couldn't leave. He was trying to work out what was he trying to do. It's the more he thought about it, the more it certainly felt like it was helping him. And for Franz Stiegler over in Germany, uh, as the war ended and as they both got on with their lives, he was thinking, again, why? Why did I do that? What call was it that I answered? And was it worth it? Like, did they make it home? Did they end up in a watery grave over the North Sea? Um, you know, did they crash land over England or did they actually get down in one piece? And both pilots would just could not let it go. And then independently of one another in the 1980s, they both started looking for each other. And this was before social media, before any kind of like immediate contact. So it was um, a slow and daunting um, process really. Um, but Charlie ended up during the early 1990s putting an advert in a German magazine. I think it was even a, a fighter association magazine in Germany. And incredibly, Franz Stiegler saw it and was incredible, like just amazed. He shouted at his wife, like, this is it. This is the story. Um, and they got in touch with each other. At this moment in time, Franz was living in Vancouver and they ended up having this incredible reunion, like these two pilots who had that amazing day just ingrained on their mind, had this absolutely incredible reunion where they came together and they greeted each other as brothers. They literally loved each other and they did until the day they died. They both passed away in 2008. And up until that moment, Franz called him my brother. They had, they had this moment, this reunion at an American airbase it was just the two, two pilots who were there alone initially uh, and they had a really tearful embrace. And then Charlie invited the rest of the crew from the old pub yeah, that had survived. And they thanked Franz for their life because Franz's decision that day spared them and gave them their life. And then after that moment had complete, all the members of the family um, of the crew of the old pub that wouldn't have been there, some 25 people all gathered around Franz to say thank you, to say thank you for what you did on that day in 1943. Just, just amazing. It makes you think that you can never underestimate the sort of ramifications of your actions, how, how you act um, towards other people. Uh, the decisions you make, big or small, can have a huge impact and huge consequences. And that's why we should always do the right thing. Like, I'm a firm believer in looking at this generation and really drawing from their example. And here we have a story of two enemies that become friends, that become more than friends, that become brothers. Because what they realise is they're both members of humanity and they're not on opposing sides um, fighting this war. So just an incredible, incredible tale. Um, and how amazing that you can go onto the top of the tower at Seeding Airfield, look across, and you can literally picture ye old pub rumbling in. The day it landed, everyone um, at Seeding Airfield looked and turned towards the sky. The ground crews, the pilots, the personnel, everyone stopped and was just looking mesmerized, thinking, oh my God, as it came into land. And that happened at Seething Airfield. So immensely proud that the airfield has that part um, to play in that story. And one of the most incredible stories from the Second World War. Thank you.